and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and I'm supremely pumped to be here with you. I also have with me one of Keyboard Player Podcasting's brightest stars, Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? Well, can I say, if, if, if I'm a star, you're, you're, a, you're a galaxy radiating oh, brilliance, yeah. David. <laughs> we're, we're just, you know, two stars in a galaxy, aren't we? Yeah. Um, we're little stars shining lights on the big stars. Let's put it that way. Oh, there you go. There you go. Maybe that could be the new tagline. I like that. <laughs> so, no, great to be here again. Um, this episode, um, we I actually want to pull the curtain back a bit. So, we've just finished uh, recording an episode with Mr. Richard Hilton or Rich Hilton. Um, it's hard to overstate his career as a keyboard player, even just purely looking at the roster of artists he's looked with, he's, he's worked with. Uh, and it, I'm not going to spend the two minutes it would take to. Uh, go through that list and he will actually talk uh, about a lot of them but I'm going to rattle off some that uh, Rich doesn't even get to talking about so I'm talking Robert Plant, Stevie Nicks, Patti LaBelle, George Duke, Ashvin Simpson, Freddie Mercury we didn't even talk about that Paul, um, uh, Tina Arena oh, we didn't even do the Aussie angle, Taylor Dane, um, Joan Jett the Ramones, Sister Sledge they are all people that we don't even get to talk about in this podcast. That's how incredible Rich Hilton's career is. And uh, we think you'll enjoy this interview a great deal. Rich, thank you, sir. It's lovely to have you here. And um, I, I haven't asked you this yet. Is it a, a nice day in, uh, I assume you're in the London area or in? I'm, I'm in London, England right now. And it's beautiful out. Oh, great, to ha- great to have you on board. And we've actually got two of the three members of this podcast in hotel rooms. So it's, it's, it's something <laughs> different. That's good. Um, so no, lovely to have you on board. And I know you're in the middle of the tour. So I thought we'd actually start off a little bit differently, Rich, and talk about the current tour rather than going back. And we'll, we will go back. Um, but, um, you know, ha- how's the current tour going? I, from what I've seen, you're playing some huge crowds and getting some incredible receptions. That's exactly how the tour is going. We're playing huge crowds and wonderfully warm receptions. And um, I have, I'm just having the time of my life. Uh, I maybe uh, sitting around for two and a half years gave us some new uh, perspective on everything, but um, I'm just so thankful for these opportunities. And I know that none of us gets an infinite number of them. And so I am just thrilled, grateful. I'm having the time of my life out here doing this. And I can't, I can't imagine these are the only large gigs you play. You've played with so many people. But, I mean, the ones I saw um, that was at the Pink Pop Festival in, in Europe and then the one on the weekend, was it at Glasgow? Or it was, uh, yeah, we played in Glasgow uh, sometime a few days ago. And, I mean, you're, <laughs> getting, you're getting mosh pits, Rich. Who would have thought that Noel Rogers and Sheik would get mosh pits? Yeah, well, I certainly wouldn't have thought so, but um, I'm not, I don't spend too much time in mosh pits. I <laughs> so. and, and what do you think? Why, why do you think the reaction? I mean, I'm not surprised. It's obviously great music and Noel's an incredibly charismatic band leader and so on, but what do you think it is that's particularly getting the reaction you, you're getting this tour? Uh, top of the list would be the songs that he wrote with, uh, mostly with Bernard Edwards, but quite often, but occasionally with others. Um, the songs are just so great and they bring a happy vibe that in to what we might call dark times is even more welcome and relevant to people's lives in perhaps a slightly deeper way than the usual function of entertainment where it just kind of exists as some form of court jester to the masses. Um, So maybe it counts for a little bit more in people's emotional lives to have this kind of an escape where people are presented with hopefully well-executed performances of great happy songs that make us all feel good about ourselves and more together than we normally feel in our daily lives. So that's kind of my armchair analysis of why it seems to be working so well. I think it also has to do with the fact that uh, as a band, we've come a long way in decades of touring now, and the show has been refined to a very 
clear point where we're presenting the songs that need to be presented in a way that has a nice arc across the length of a show. So there's technical reasons in terms of show business why maybe it's working as well. But I think at top of the list is songs and the need in the culture for people to have happy experiences. Great. No, I, th- I think that's a superb take. And um, you've, you've just talked about your experience and how many decades a lot of you have worked together. So, I mean, you've been working with Noel Rogers since um, 1988, I, I think it is. Um, so what, what would you say the secret has been to the success of that relationship throughout? His extraordinary tolerance for my weirdness. That would be the first secret <laughs> to the longevity. Um, I, uh, I was, I think if I have to attribute any part of it to, to my own skill set, it's that I had a really, really broad grounding in a lot of different disciplines when I met him. And so even though the job evolved multiple times across that period of time, and certainly didn't start out to be playing keyboards and chic, um, I was, I had a skill set that allowed me to adapt to the needs of his creative flow at various times. And uh, along with his extraordinary patience, as I mentioned before, I think that's sort of what happened. They say that, and I'm not drawing myself as a picture of this, mind you, but they say that success is the meeting of uh, opportunity and preparation. And I was very well prepared, but I also was preparing for something completely different in my life when this call came that started this whole journey with Nile Rogers and uh, had no idea and certainly had no reason to expect that what I would be doing at this age at this time would be anything like what's going on now. Absolutely. Yeah, I can only imagine. And and just before we get delve into that sort of some of that background, I, I did mention two festivals there, the one in Glasgow and um, the Pink Pop one, but there was obviously that little little uh, not well-known festival called Glastonbury. Is that the first time you played Glastonbury? No, no. We played it in 2013. Okay. On the West Holt stage to a giant and very receptive audience. And uh, that was a, a great moment for us. And uh, then subsequently we played on the Pyramid stage in 2017, which I believe has been broadcast any number of times over here at the very least. I don't know where else in the world, but uh, in England, it seems that everybody's seen it. And that was a big day and a fun day. Uh, Who was it? Um, Barry Gibb went on before us. And uh, for me, one of the great memories of that day is getting to watch him sing those great songs. I mean, I had never seen the Bee Gees and I was a great fan of the Bee Gees, of course, throughout their career careers. And, um, cause they had more than one. And, uh, so that was a fun day in general, 2017, we played in Glastonbury and, uh, a giant sea of people, not unlike what happened yesterday. And, uh, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a stunning thing to participate in happiness with people on that scale. It's very, very humbling and uh, makes me feel like I've been blessed with gigantic privilege. Um, uh, However, that came about and I'm just stunned by the moment usually. Uh, I'm not intimidated by the moment and I'm not scared by the moment, but I am uh, profoundly moved by that experience every time it never gets normal to me it never gets like less profound i uh, i saw an interview with i saw an interview with you uh, rich where you said that the the only time that you'd really been i guess starstruck to the point where you well with all the all the incredible artists that you played with and we'll we'll certainly discuss that in a bit more depth as we go along but you mentioned the only time where it it perhaps overcame was once when you were uh, sitting right next to Eric Clapton with a guitar in your hand and uh, (laughs) and the moment was a little bit overwhelming to be able to play is that is a am I quoting the interview correctly yes my hands turned to blocks of wood immediately (laughs) it was amazing uh you know because I can play some guitar uh, I'm not Nile Rogers by any means, or Eric Clapton, that's for sure. But um, I was sitting with a guitar of mine, and he was sitting, we were taking a picture together, and he was like, come on, let's play. And for some reason, I locked up. I hadn't locked up when I had to play with the Vaughn brothers. So um, I think that's interesting. Uh, 
but I was absolutely momentarily starstruck and intimidated. <laughs> and being, yeah, 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 it was like, oh boy. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, I'm, I, I, you try not to be starstruck because professionally it doesn't serve the moment very well. Yeah. And because my experience of, uh, this is a whole separate discussion about people who become famous as young people and how that affects their life and how they grow through adulthood uh, with that experience. And I've met a, a bunch of them now. I mean, from Diana Ross to Eric Clapton to you, you name it. These were, you know, these people were 16, 17 years old when they started to become giant stars and it affects how you develop as an adult. But I think one of the aspects of it is that they love to feel normal. I know that sounds odd, but because so many people are, you know, tying their shoes or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they, they like, you know, these pictures of Clapton doing his own laundry, you know, like, like they just like feeling the experience of normal life because um, it's not always fun being famous. And um, so I start sort of from there in my interactions with these people. And that doesn't usually include you you're there are expressions of respect and and uh admiration but it doesn't fall into this sort of fealty um tying of the shoes thing um so uh i don't often get starstruck to the point like you know i got over it with bowie in about 30 seconds um yep. You know, it, it, with different people, it's differently. I didn't feel that. I felt that way about Paul Simon, but I wasn't intimidated in the least. Is that because he's a little guy? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's it's different with everybody. And, and Elton was just for me because I grew up in high school. People knew me as the kid who played all the Elton John songs, and they were new songs at the time. Um, so for me to meet and play with Elton was was beyond wildest dreams. there are these beyond wildest dreams moments where guys i idolized as a kid become my friends in some yeah. distance like we don't necessarily exchange christmas cards but it's all warm hugs when i see them elton steve winwood uh carrie Minear from general giant who may count less with the general public than the preceding two but with me is right there in the hall of fame um yeah people who i've become like friends with who as a kid I idolized and looked up to and wanted to be like in some musical way. And that's, you know, that's amazing stuff. I never take it for granted. Not for one second. Yeah. Well, um, I, 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 what you say makes perfect sense, Rich, because I, I think people just like to be treated with respect and, and like normal people. So I'm, I'm sure that that goes the same for uh, incredibly uh, popular and well-known musicians, just as it does for anyone in any other walk of life. So it's obviously served you well. Uh, so it makes perfect sense. I was, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking about what you said about the, um, the, the, the current band that you're in now. And again, it, with, within the context of all the different people that you've played with, you were saying how, how well it gels. I, I did a bit of, internet stalking and saw a few clips posted on Facebook of the current tour. So the one you're currently on. And to me, the band seems incredibly tight. And like all these bands that you've played with are going to be tight because we're talking top level professionals. But uh, is, is my perception right that uh, Noel Rogers and Sheik is uh, maybe next level in terms of uh, how tight and how well it's flowing on stage for you guys? Um, it's I can't step outside of it. I can't float above it and give you a objective assessment of that as it relates yep. to the other bands are or aren't tight. But I can tell you that I feel really good about the way we're playing, that we set each of us sets a very high bar for the ensemble as a whole. And each of us views, I believe, our role in the band as supporting everybody else on that stage yep. as a primary motivating goal. And so I think we've got a combination that works well, and I feel really good about it. Yeah. But as to how that plays in the world of tight bands, uh, I don't think I can be objective because I love tight bands and I love other tight bands. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And we just I just sat at breakfast with two of my bandmates and talked sports and music for like forty five minutes after we were done eating, and one of the topics that we covered was. Um, 
the importance of teamwork, both in sport and in music, mm -hmm. and how one as a participant applies himself to the goal of successful teamwork. And I think that there's a similarity there in terms of the way people relate on a basketball court or a hockey rink or a baseball field or a football pitch or whatever um, to each other as a team in terms of the overall success of the endeavor. It's also true in bands, and we all have uniquely giant love and respect for each other as diverse as we are as individuals and as diverse as our backgrounds are. And as, um, for want of a better term, eccentric as artists can be in their own personal habit and style, we're all like loaded with love and forgiveness for each other. And we're surrounded by an incredibly talented bunch of crew and management people. I mean, the, uh, we were just talking about this yesterday. The, we've managed to attract this extraordinary level of, of people who work with us behind the scenes to make the show work very, very well. And some of them are really young people. Some of them are younger than my kids. Um, and they're fantastic. And I love seeing that. And I love feeling that. And I really enjoy my interactions with young people in general, just as a sort of an aside to this point. But um, yeah, so uh, whether we're tighter or not as tight as any other tight band, um, I feel really good about what we're doing. And I've just yeah. got a really, really critical question. Sorry to jump in, Paul, but um, breakfast, <laughs> Rich, English breakfast. So are we talking fried mushrooms and all that stuff or more reasonable toast and juice stuff? I, in my own case, uh, breakfast is all about fiber for me uh, as, a, as, a, as a man of my age and, and uh, medical history. Um, yeah, it's all about the fiber in the morning. So uh, it tends to be more granola, yogurt, fruit. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a great denizen of the continental breakfast these yes. days, <laughs> whereas many of my bandmates are ordering hot breakfasts quite often of varying kinds. Uh, you know, uh, avocado on toast has become a fa fairly popular medium for some people. Everybody's got their own way of crafting a healthy lifestyle that allows you to do five gigs in five different countries on five consecutive days, which is, we just finished yesterday. That's right. I think, I think there's a whole series of episodes in yeah, maintaining diet and fiber and, and good bowel habits on tour, but we won't go there today, Rich. That's good. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's certainly more grueling than, than people probably think. It's it's physical physically hard work. So yeah, looking after oneself is actually important. I was I was thinking about your your analogy about sport and music and the the power of teamwork, and I, I think that's a really apt one uh, personally myself. Uh, taking that to a a more finer point, on at the moment you share keys duties with uh, Russell Graham. How have you worked out the the flow between the two of you? How how does that dynamic work? The dynamic has evolved since Sheik reformed in the mid nineties, which was before Russell's participation. And each of the people who played in the band along with me brought their own particular approach to that seat in the band. So let's start from here. When I started playing live with Sheik in the mid nineties, when Sheik started playing live again, um, I had to figure out what my role was going to be based on the fact that the original band had toured with actual string players with Marcus Berry pickups on their violins. And that we were now going to be representing string parts and keyboards, and that was going to be part of my job. So I had the previous, the early Chic had two keyboard players, and one of them was substantially playing pianos and maybe organs and the other one had like Rhodes and clavinet or there was some di division of labor something like that so you basically could have a piano player and a Rhodes player at the same time and then you'd have clavinets and mugs and things that were available in the 1970s so that was kind of how the di division of labor worked in the early band when it came time to put it back together in the 90s we were going to need to be able to represent the string parts from the keyboard section so those roles were going to change by definition and so what i did for the first couple of things we had to do, which were a, con a very short show in New York in late 95, and then the super producer tour in 96, with, of which there's a DVD, and we played two and a half hours with various artists, and we started with nothing, no repertoire. We had to build a two and a half hour show around five or six guest artists and chic material that we hadn't previously played together. So at that point, excuse me, I just kind of did 
as much as I could, knowing that Philippe Sace would also be there doing as much as he could and that we'd work it out, which we did. And then when it came time to form a chic to tour with, because what happened as any, well, some people will know, is that at the end of that super producer tour in Japan, Bernard Edwards passed away. And so there was no chic for a bit. And there was a question about how they, how or if he was going to continue with anything called chic without Bernard Edwards. And it was decided uh, that there would be. And um, at that point, I kind of had to figure out what to do. And at that point, the other keyboard player was the great late Catrice Barnes, who was just unfortunately really recently passed away. And the roles kind of evolved into that side. The, the other, the person who was not me was mostly playing piano parts. And I was playing Rhodes, clavinet, and strings, organs, things, uh, the color keyboards, the not core piano bits, but also Rhodes parts that were kind of like core piano bits. But, but uh, mine was more the color chair, and that was more presenting piano playing at a very, very high level. In the case of every single one of the people who have sat in that chair, they're far better piano players than I am. But they're, but, and they each took on a different aspect of the role because the music is tricky that way and it, and people approach it differently. Um, so as it relates to your question about Russell, by the time Russell became, he started subbing, I think in 2006 in that chair, in the piano chair, and then became the guy in that chair in 2014, as well as Niles production partner, uh, which was a role I had held for like 25 years or something at that point. And uh, all of which is great and good. And I support a thousand percent and it's all, you know, it's great. Russell's fantastically talented and wonderful guy. And uh, he's, he's like a little brother to me and I love him dearly and think the world of his ability and his intellect. So, um, and his heart and his family. So by the time he got there, the roles as they are have been pretty much proscribed and it's a question of how do you fit your skill set into the role that that chair is offered and there were times along the way where i actually played that chair and somebody else was playing what had previously been my chair and there were a couple of gigs that went like that too so that's how it breaks down and that's how it evolved is i mostly play colorful colors synthesizers and clavinets and things like that. And the other guy is mostly playing Russ in this case, piano parts, synth basses now, now that we've got synth basses, uh, things like Let's Dance require a synth bass. Um, vocoder, things like Get Lucky rely very heavily on the fact that there's a vocoder uh, bridge in the song. Um, so Russ has actually expanded that. And Russ is also a spectacularly good singer, which I'm like an okay singer. So that helps a lot. And, um, and we both play guitar. So in cases where we're supporting guest artists at Niles Foundation Galas, there have been cases where all of us are playing guitar parts, you know, which is a pretty like cool thing to get to do. And uh, I've had some great, great experiences. And plus, and then, you know, we both get to play guitar at sound checks, but Niall can't make it. That's fun too. Right. Yeah. Look, it's it sounds like you've got a very synergistic relationship there that you you've worked out over time. So no, that's that's wonderful, wonderful context. And and so while we're still talking keyboards, then let's talk about your rig on your current current tour rig. So what what are you actually using, and you know how long have you been using it, and are you well established with what you do as far as boards? So. Uh... As a brief history, when I started in the 90s and playing live gigs with the band, we had an, an endorsement with an American company called Ensonic. And I really quite liked their products. And at the time, I was playing Ensonic keyboards on stage. And in the Budokan video, you see Ensonic TS-12, I think a 12 on the bottom, and some other Ensonic keyboard that escapes my memory at the top. And the way I had it laid out was the, the bot of the two keyboards, the bottom keyboard is sort of my color keyboard. It's got the string sounds on it. It's got any synthesizer, you know, like basically any synthesis I'm doing on these keyboards is assembling their romplers as they're known in the trade. In other words, you know, you know what a rompler is. It's basically a workstation without a sequencer. Um, so, and it may even have a 
crude sequence or anything. But uh, so I have to assemble synthesis out of the available elements. It's not an actual synthesizer engine in any of this. So any synthesis I'm doing, I'm assembling out of Rompler elements. And that was true back in the Ensonic days. And I actually back in the Ensonic days, you had the advantage of being able to use trans waves and, uh, and uh, modulate them. So you could get some really nice motion and color without having to have, because they also don't have resonant filters, the Ensonics. So you don't have the ability to quack like a duck, but you do have the ability to create nice sort of pulse width like modulations within waveforms, you know, using uh, modulating along a trans wave. So um, I, my bottom keyboard is generally the color stuff and the top keyboard and, and has song programs written for song by song by song. So if I need a string patch, it's got a name that says, you know, dance, 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 or dance times three in my case. And, uh, and if I need to be able to do things like tubular bells, like, and I want your love, I've got a split keyboard and there's octave strings over here and there's a tubular bell over here. And I play all those ridiculously fast string runs in the middle from the bottom end of the keyboard because that's just where they are and there's Rhodes up here so the top keyboard is Rhodes's clavinets organs a couple of synths um that I just select on buttons like they're not song they're not written as song programs they're not in a sequence it's just I know what I need on any given song um on uh, Like a Virgin there's actually a pizzicato string part I play on the top keyboard while I'm playing synth on the bottom keyboard so it's kind of divided up that way in general, in my world. And oh, so what am I using? I'm, uh, these days I'm using an RD700GX on the bottom, which is a 15 or more old Roland keyboard. I like the Roland weighted action. I like playing weighted actions. I'm a piano player since I was five years old. And um, I like playing 88 note weighted actions. And I like Roland's the best. I, and actually, I like a certain period of Roland the best. I'm not even sure I still like Roland the best, but I did like this particular period that these keyboards are from. In fact, I just bought myself uh, one of their home piano products for my uh, home studio, only for the sole reason that it has that same key bed in it, because I just like the way that thing feels and responds under my hands. So RD700GX on the bottom. These days, an RD800 on the top. Um, Again, at least a 10-year-old, 12-year-old design, the RD800. Um, got the same keyboard. I like to have the same feel on top and bottom. It's just, if I can get it, I'll take it. I like it that way because I only have to think about one technique across two hands instead of this one's weighted and this one's not weighted and that one's a little bit, you know, spongy and this one's not, you know, mm -hmm. it's a little soft in the bottom, you know, so... I'm comfortable with the key beds. I'm comfortable with the reliability. I've had to play in blizzards. I, I played in the rain a couple of nights ago where it was raining on the rig while I was playing it. I mean, you need gear that's going to hold up on the road and the rolling gear has held up on the road really, really well. Whereas some gear, I used Kurzweil for a while in between the Ensonic and the Roland stuff. And as much as I loved the sound of the thing and I quite loved some of the features, most notably the ribbon controller for what I have to do with his fake string falls. Um, uh, it, they failed on me a couple of times and were not robust enough to work in extreme weather conditions, which bizarrely enough is a consideration as we once played a gig in 24 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, minus seven or eight in, in Celsius? Yeah. Um, <laughs> outside. And uh, the Kurzweil failed. Uh, it, it, uh, it was on, the sustain pedal was down through the whole show, no matter what you did. And I had to play literally firing all notes off commands with my left hand throughout the entire show just to get through the show. Um, so... So that wasn't going to happen again. So I switched to Roland and this stuff has never failed me, including in a blizzard at Zagreb in 2006 when literally we were getting snowed on and pelted throughout the entire show. So uh, those are the considerations. And, and also the fact that I can show up, I don't have it here, but I can show up with uh, a set of in-ears and a flash drive. I like to say I come with less than the oboe player. You know, I can go to the gig with less than the oboe. <laughs> That's awesome another consideration i don't want to tech my own gear 
You know, I kind of yeah. want to have to do the crew in order to play the gig. And I love the crew. And don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not some sort of hoity-toity thing. It's just that you need your rest when you're going to do what we're doing and the level we're doing it. And being on the crew is not part of that. Oh, reliability is so, so important, I think. Um, and if, you, if you're going to be uh, touring the UK, not to uh, cast shade on our, uh, our friends and listeners in that part of the world, the weather can be very unpredictable even in summer. So, uh, yeah, really critical. You've actually, I'm the one uh, in the band who doesn't mind the cold. Um, oh, really? Most of the rest of them do, and for good reasons. But I grew up playing ice hockey outside, so I'm used uh. to the cold. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's it's not good for the fine motor skills, the cold weather, that's for sure. So I, I, I admire you. No I have no problem <laughs> with my hands in the cold. Oh, that's Guitar awesome. would be different. Guitar is a little harder to play in the cold because you're actually touching the vibration. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't touch the vibration. We operate machines. Yes, very true. Very true. You, you, your point about the sustain pedal that, uh, that wouldn't work or, or would work too much, um, actually takes us to an area we love to go with all our guests, if you don't mind, Rich, and that is, uh, are you able to tell us a story uh, from, from any point in your career where you may have had a, a very memorable technical or musical train wreck on stage? That was the worst one. That oh, was really? the worst one. Yeah, that was uh, mostly the gear works. I Have I ever had to reboot a key, you know, stop playing and reboot a keyboard in the middle of something? Yeah, not for a long time. The rolling stuff, not usually. Once you figure out that you can usually switch your way out of it rather than reboot your way out of it. Um, not too many. Uh, maybe that's where the preparation comes in. But uh, yeah, because I am looking at changing the rig and I am looking at what it's going to take to do that. And there's going to be a fair amount of preparation that has to go into making that happen if I'm going to switch to the newer gear, which part of me wants to do and part of me thinks, I don't know, there's really nothing broken about this. Um, but I think I might be able to make the show a little bit better if I use more recent gear, uh, that has more capabilities and more, uh, so I'm looking into that. But anyway, uh, as far as technical nightmares on stage, not too often, not too many, not usually for me. Um, I mean, I could talk about other band members who, whose gear fails, but, uh, generally speaking, not too much for me. That's good. That's what you want, Rich. That's excellent. If gear, yeah, look at the idea. A cold, a minus, you know, minus temperature sustained pedal incident. If that's the worst it's been, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, huge shout out to Roland for that. Um, so in, in our introduction to the show, um, Rich, we, we sort of tried to rattle off at least a, a sample of the artists you've worked with over the years, and they are they are incredible. Um, so rather than trying to go through, I, I was wondering if you had say five artists that stood out to you that you've that really were notable to you as a keyboard player that you enjoyed working with. Otherwise I can throw five quite diverse ones at you from your incredible list from your website. Well my list may not be the same as yours. So why don't I give you my five first? Yeah, please. Yeah, them. please. Um I've mentioned most of them. Uh because of the way they relate to my interest in music as a young person and my development. Um Winwood, Elton John, and Kerry Minear have to come near the top of the list for that. And the uh, the interesting thing is knowing Kerry Minear has nothing to do with Nile Rodgers or playing in Chic or any of that. It's just because I'm a fan of Gentle Giant and I got involved in the fan movement quite early in the internet and uh, we became friends. Um, of the people I've worked with beyond that, Bowie, um, and Rich, can I ask you, you just said within 30 seconds earlier that you'd gotten over any, any um, you know, awe of Bowie. What was it? Did he put you at ease immediately or you just got a grasp of his personality straight away? Well, it, the first meeting was a room full of people and he pops in a cassette and plays the demo of the song Jump, They Say, which I don't know if you've ever heard, but it's from the album Black Tie, White Noise, which is the album we did together. And it contains a lot of odd sounding, backwards sounding source material making up the track. And he's playing this and saying, this is the thing we're going to start with. And I'm sitting there across the room going, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, and then the, and then the guy on the other shoulder, you know, the guy with the halo, not the guy with the pitchfork says, 
just remain calm and wait and see where it goes. And, da, 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 da. and so I'm sitting there like smiling, waiting to see what's going to happen. And uh, turns out he knows where all those sounds came from. And he's got a multi-track tape that he brought from Switzerland that has all those sounds on him. And we thread it onto a two machine, two inch machine backwards. And we find locate to this, all these backwards sounds that he pulled from this multi-track. And I, I have a sync clavier. Um, so I'm pulling everything into the sync clavier. And then my job becomes to recreate more or less, with, along with other people, what he had uh, in preparation for us playing a basic track session, which was going to include that and other songs. So that was the beginning of David Bowie. And um, there was definitely a moment of, oh, my God, how am I going to get those sounds? And then uh, it turned out he had them all. So that was, that was you know, whoosh, you know. Um, and what question? And remind me of my question. And then, so, sorry, just the other four. Uh, that was my fault for interrupting. So just well, besides Bowie, David, yeah. uh, well, I said David, Steve, Elton John, and um, and 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 uh, Kerry. Um, Richard, can I can I just sorry? Can I just butt in and ask you a question about Kerry Minear? Is, yeah. is is that you at the very start of the proclamation uh, official fan video that's uh, come out in recent times? That is me sitting at the 1914 Steinway O grand piano that I grew up playing and that my father wow. inherited from his own wow. that is now in my dining room, former dining room. Um, and that's where what you're seeing and where you're seeing it. And that's Wow, that's so cool. So so just to clue in our, our viewers and our listeners, um, if, if you're not a real expert on, on Gentle Giant, I check them out, a really amazing perhaps uh, a prog rock band that doesn't get as much notoriety as, as perhaps some of your, your more well-known ones like like Yes and, and uh, Genesis and this sort of thing, but an amazing uh, prog rock band, Kerry Manier, phenomenal keyboard player. And uh, we'll, we'll link to it in the, in, the, in, the show, in the show notes. There's an amazing fan video of Proclamation, which is a, a wonderful song they put out. And uh, you can see, as I, as I suspected, Richard right at the start, as, as he said, along with a, a lot of other very notable and some not so notable keyboard players and fans of the music. It's, it's, I, won't, I won't give it away. Have a watch of it because it's just an incredible thing to watch. So uh, sorry to interrupt there, but I just had to know if that was well, you, Richard. And one other thing I would like to add to, to, add to what you just said is that the, uh, the band, much to the amazement of all of us, Band members appear in this video. Absolutely, yeah, they do. Performing in ways that they never performed when they were in the band, and that uh, it, it brought me to tears the first time I saw it. It was so it was so amazing to see them do that. It, to me, that's a, such a generous thing for them to do because it wasn't built around them doing it, which is the same way the fan movement developed. It wasn't built around their participation, but they kind of caught wind of it. And we kind of assured them that, no, it won't look like a Star Trek convention where there's a hundred people <laughs> waiting for you. And, and, and pretty soon we're all jamming together and playing their material together. And there's actual video of me and my sons performing Gentle Giant music with members of Gentle Giant. I mean, it's, it evolved into something really, really special and unique and uh, trusting. And that was, that's a cool thing. And so they're pretty much all friends of mine now. And it's a wonderful life experience for me because it meant yeah, so much to me it's, it's an amazing video to behold it really is so congratulations to all involved it's, it's fantastic sorry david i just jumped in on your uh, your question there mate but it was i had to know you know no, the no, video was made by the son of derek shulman ah okay yes so derek right, shulman yes. was the lead singer and one of the primary uh founders of the group gentle giant and was previously known as simon dupree in simon dupree and the big sound who had some kind of hit over here and uh, and uh, his son Noah is the guy who made that video. Truly a labor of love. It was. Yeah, he's a good, great guy, Noah. Also. No, that's so, your other question. The fifth is a. I'm struggling because how am I going to choose between Diana Ross, Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan, um, <laughs> I know Richie. David Lee Roth, how am I going to choose between those guys for number five? I don't know. They were all really, really life-changing experiences for me and produced some profound moments and some incredibly funny stories. And I don't know. It's been way beyond anything I could have ever imagined or dreamed. 
And uh, I'm so thankful for the relationships I've had with creative people and for the opportunity I've had to share creative experiences with people because they're really uh, very special things to do. And and Rich, I, I'm gonna. I hope you don't mind um, sort of uh, entertaining a fanboy, but I'm a massive Cars fan. So, what was your involvement with Rick Ocasek? Was it on some of his solo album stuff, or uh, we did a album with Rick Ocasek, an album called Fireball Zone yes. in 1990 yeah. with the band, substantially with the band that we had as a house band for a TV show that Nile was on in the states called New Visions on VH1 and. Um, I was in the band and, and that was sort of the core band for that project. Um, I was thrilled to be working with and meeting Rick Ocasek because I was such a massive fan of his music and I spent all kinds of time grilling him about aspects of the albums that meant the most to me. And he was very generous with his time in talking about them and had brought in very, very sort of specific demos where my role was going to be very much to be greg hawks as much as possible um to his thing because that's what works and that's what's appropriate although there's an extent to which i do that and that he presented that in the demos and then there's an extent to which i was allowed to go off sort of into my own area and i mentioned trans waves earlier and it was one of the first uh years that the i believe it was called a vfx at the time by ansonic it appeared and that offered trans wave uh, modulation synthesis uh in lieu of having resonant filters and so I did manage to create some really nice pads for that album using transwave modulation because um, I was fascinated by the possibility and it was new. So I was like, let's do that, you know. And uh, Rick, Rick was very interesting to work with. Uh, I can tell you a few things. For example, that Gibson SG guitar that you see him playing since Cars 1 had the same strings on it that it had when he bought it. Wow. And he was never he was not gonna change them. Now Bernard Edwards used to do some version of this too, by the way. Some people get to like the way the string sound ages. And Rick is one of you know, Rick is mostly chump 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 guitars. Um and it works for that. It sounds great like that. And he didn't want new strings for that. And he was like, no, <laughs> no, I do not want new strings for this guitar. And secondly, um, we got into a, a John and Marsha conversation. What is that? There's some piece of theater where these two people meet on a park bench and start into a conversation about their past. And they discover that not only did they know each other, but they're like former lovers or whatever. And like John, Marsha, you know? All right. So Rick and I had a sort of a John and Marsha moment when we're talking and I mentioned that I lived in Boston for a while or outside of Boston in Somerville. And he goes, Oh yeah, I used to live in Somerville. Where'd you live? And I said, I used to live off of Somerville Avenue. And he goes, that's funny. I used to live off of Somerville. Well, Somerville Avenue is pretty big. All right. So what street did you live on? I used to live on spring. I used to live on spring street. So it turned out at the end of this John and Marsha conversation that Rick Ocasek and I had lived in the same house eight years apart. That is surreal. Oh. Uh, it was a triplex, and he had lived on the first floor, and I had lived on the third, so we didn't live in the same space in the same house, but we lived in the same house at the same address eight years apart, and he was there with Ben Orr when they were forming the cars. Wow. I just All I know is I want to move there to pick up some more musical chops between you and those guys. <laughs> There's something, obviously, in that building. Yeah, David, you live on the second floor, so <laughs> yeah. you should get all the well, ones from... Yeah, yeah perfect. Right. <laughs> Those were, those were some tough times for me, so I would have come real cheap back then. <laughs> I would have come real cheap back when I was in Somerville, like slogging it out. Uh, but uh, I loved it, and uh, it was a formative time for me. Yeah. I used to uh, work in Harvard when we were selling audio equipment. Okay. Now, that look, that's an amazing – I'm glad I asked that, Rich. That's, yeah, amazing. And I can imagine you've got some amazing stories for each of those. But sadly, we've got to move on because, yeah, there's so many people. There. Maybe we'll need a, another episode down the track. Um, but from from all those learnings that you've had from from all these people you've played with and, and you know, playing so many gigs in, in, in so many different contexts, what are some key lessons you'd pass on to other players, you know, coming into the industry now that you, you wish you'd known when you'd started? Everybody, uh, I, this is so philosophical, um, so I'm going to apologize in advance. 
Um, everybody has to find a place in their life for the music that they want. In other words, some people find a place in for music in their life in the table radio in the corner, and that's as far as it gets, and that's fine. Um, we all need that. We all, th th those people are just as important to this entire process as anybody who's trying to create it. Um, and that place can be negotiable. So as an example in my own life, for the 10 years before I got the call from Nile Rodgers, I was not performing music live, certainly, as my primary source of income for any of those years. I was doing other things for money. And I had made a very specific decision when I graduated college to keep music special in my life and not just take any gig that was offered to me for money, even if I didn't care for the music or didn't care about they didn't like the this you know the feeling or the vibe of that. I decided I was going to keep music special in my life, and I could do other things for money. Now, very different world from today, insofar as you could very easily go out and get jobs back then. I and mean, when I say go out, there was an active retail uh, environment that you could go to, and I did work some retail jobs. I worked some electronic service jobs. I used to install home theaters and rich people's houses for a company that did that. I, I had all kinds of different jobs that involved interacting with people. This world isn't so much like that. There aren't that many of those jobs and young people don't seem as deeply involved in interacting with people as they do with interacting with their devices, which I'm not passing judgment on, but it's just an observation. So feel your muse Follow it. Don't be deterred. Don't be distracted, but don't place yourself in a position where while you're developing, you have to rely on it for an income. Um, find ways to make money that allow you to be the musician you want to be. Um, figure out who you want to be. Figure out who you are. Figure out what that music is that you should be making. Figure out how it provides satisfaction for you, first of all, and for your listeners, secondly. Um, do things that interest you. Never stop learning. Study, read, learn gear. The gear doesn't make the music you do, but you're going to need some tools. It's kind of hard to build a house without a hammer, so you're going to need a hammer. Um, uh, it's not a straight line. My career was nothing like a straight line, and you have to be prepared to roll with the punches and float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, as Ali used to do in the ring. Um, uh, and then what I used to tell my students when I was teaching this at college is, everything I tell you is 50% of what you need to succeed. And the other 50% is you being a cool person, being an articulate and intelligent person, learning how to listen to people and respond to their needs and not go off on your own tangents, being able to provide, the, these are essentially service jobs in, in a way. It's not quite the same as carrying bags to somebody's room in a hotel, but it's not that far removed from it either. And you have to approach it like a service job. So you have to make sure that your client, whoever your client is, whether it's your boss or the artist or the studio or whoever you're working for, is being well served by your being there. And being aware, uh, having awareness of that and self-awareness uh, of your role in that and your relationships and maintaining those relationships is just like life skills. Um, so that's the other 50%. You know, we can talk about gear and technique and how do you use a compressor on a vocal and we could talk about all of that stuff all day long, but it's only half of what you need to know to succeed in this business. Unless you're very, very lucky and become the artist, in which case maybe you got through without all of those skills, but that's not how it worked for me. I found I had to do that. I was the son of a school teacher and I was held to a high standard as a kid. And I think it's, it's actually served me well. I think that's great. And I'm, I'm making the call here, Paul. I reckon that's the most articulate tips for future cable players in 53 episodes. I'm making the call right now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, it was that was actually really, really good. Really, uh, thanks for being so generous with your thoughts there, Rich. Thank you. Um, yeah, Thank it's very you. quite profound, actually. Um, I, you know, I, I really like the idea of, um, you know, uh, understand uh, what you need to do to become the musician you want to be. I think that's uh, whatever that might be. I think that's a really cool way of looking at it. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. That was uh, wonderful, okay. Rich. A keyboard player that you admire 
that if the planets aligned, you'd love to see uh, interviewed on this show? Well, when I walked off stage, where was it? <laughs> before Hyde Park. Where was I before I was in Hyde Park? Ah, at the North Street Jazz Festival. I was looking into the eyes of Corey Henry. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, Rich. We I wish. walked over yeah. and I gave him a hug and thanked him. And uh, what a stunning, stunning musician he is. So you you could you couldn't do much better than Corey Henry. Yeah, you know? we'll, we'll try to the day we die, Rich. We'll try to the day we die. Yeah, what an absolute. I, it's hard to describe him. Yeah, he's a superstar, isn't he? Yeah, he's a superstar. He's a natural. You see him, and he was clearly born into it. it he, all he had to do, all he does, is it, he just lets it come through. It, you, uh, there's a point in the performance part, and this is important to me in terms. Somebody asked me recently about my performance preparation. And I have to get really calm. I do breathing. I do slow breathing and stuff. I, I try to bring my heart rate down. I try to get to an absolute place of peace and clarity. And then when I play a show, I'm basically like in a trance. I'm so in the feedback moment of listening and correcting and listening and correcting and listening and correcting and, and just feeling and not thinking and not intervening and not, you know, the voice in the back of my head about picking up a quart of milk on the way home and all of that, you know, like nothing. None of it. It all goes away. It all has to go away. And I have to get to that place where the only thing is this thing right here. And, and then I can, I can, it's just like getting out of the way. It's getting out of your own way and letting it come through you. And some people describe it in different ways. And some people think it's religious and some people think whatever, they have higher power. And maybe, maybe, absolutely. There's something, there's something that's running all that. Cause if I can really, really get, out of the way I, it just comes out it just pours out of you and it's such a, such a magical place to be because it requires so much trust and i've said and niall has actually quoted me saying um that the, it, for those 90 minutes the safest place in the world is on stage with Sheik, and i don't even think about anything else or yeah I, I, if i think about anybody else it's my family but but uh for the most part, it's just um, getting out of the way and letting stuff flow through you. And so you see a guy like Corey Henry, and it just feels like it's being channeled from some like magical place because it just comes out of him, no matter what he's playing. Have you seen him play the harpeggi? Yes. You know what the harpeggi is? That that string mm -hmm. instrument, that sort of rectangular string instrument mm -hmm. with fret, frets going this way. Oh my God. Like the musicianship that comes through all of it you you recognize in some guys the same voice coming through multiple different uh instruments stevie wonder for example the harmonica playing is just like the vocal louis armstrong the trumpet player is just like the vocal uh you you find certain artists where it's one voice speaking through different mediums and um cory henry has that he he's, he he comes through whatever he's playing and it's remarkable yeah, I, mean, I think that's a brilliant pick, Rich. Yeah, so we, we, yeah, we, we live in hope of getting Corey on the show one day. Um, so speaking of inspirational artists, can can you rattle off five albums that inspire the hell out of you? If you you know you're stuck with only five albums, what, what would they be? Where did I put my five album list? There it is. Um, I'm generally not comfortable with lists but no. i'm willing to do it and i will preface this by saying that if you ask me tomorrow it's probably it could be very easily five different because i'm going to go with five influential albums because i don't think i do favorites very well there's so many things that i like that to exclude things as favorites almost yeah. offends me so if i don't mention bach and beethoven it doesn't work for me so that's not good reasonable so approach. five influential albums as they uh, occurred in my life starting off with Meet the Beatles, which was the American version of, uh, I believe it was called With the Beatles, but it was the first Beatles album that was commercially released in the United States. And that would have to be the first most influential album because I, I would get up every morning, go downstairs, play that thing five times through and pretend to be John Lennon. Just, um, as a, just as an aside, Rich, when you said it brought a tear to your eye, the Gentle Giant video, just recently seeing McCartney at 80 um, do that duet with John Lennon up on the screen at Glastonbury, that brought a tear to my eye. And I, I don't think I'm alone there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very touching. 
very ni- nice piece of uh, production theater that they've done. And, and it is really, really touching, especially now that we've seen the Peter Jackson documentary, which brings us a little closer to that process in that period. Yeah. So, and, and, get, and gives us all a chance to forgive everybody for the BS that we've been told about the way they really were, which is not always the case. Um, so yeah, agreed. Very touching moment. And for me, I actually, that's another time I was starstruck is when we're playing at some smaller stage in Hyde Park for some smaller gathering of people a few years ago. And Niall comes walking up with Paul McCartney and we all get to shake his hand. And I absolutely froze. Um, when I yeah, the voice in my head said, "You're about to shake the hand of Paul McCartney," and I went, "Oh!" Um, so anyway, uh, second influential album, uh, "Are You Experienced" by Jimi Hendrix. Now you can sort of tell when I grew up based on these uh, album selections, and I am uh, and how old I am, which is 65 years old right now. Uh, so I can remember like it was five minutes ago, the first time I heard Hendrix and what it did to my heart and what it felt like and sounded like and how it was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. And this was, this is number two on my five influential albums list. And, and they're sort of in no particular order, but they're sort of chronological. The next one would be the Intermounting Flame by the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which came out in the early seventies and uh, featured the, first version of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which is a hard group to beat anywhere. You want to talk about tight bands, good God. Um, And that album twisted my head around and made me think about music completely differently. The modal aspects, the rhythmic aspects, you know, the the prime number rhythms and stuff like that. Billy Cobham's Intro to Vital Transformation, just on its own. Um, (laughs) Everything. Uh, Dance of the Maya, it's just an absolute freaking masterpiece, start to finish. To this day, I still think it's one of the greatest things ever recorded in a studio. Uh, next one on my list is A Love Supreme by John Coltrane, which actually predates the Intermounting Flame and is widely regarded as one of the most influential jazz albums ever made. And again, provides a completely unique texture and wonderful compositional development style that is to this day transcendent in my view and is fantastic. And then the last one is something that practically nobody's ever heard, which is an EP of, uh, that I, my parents had of Oscar Peterson, uh, which uh, for a series that was called uh, Jazz at the Philharmonic that Norman Granz, the promoter, uh, had started and recorded. And this was, I believe, Peterson's premier performance at Carnegie Hall in New York in the 1950s. And it's two approximately 10 or 12 minute sides of his playing. And it again, transformed the way I heard music for life. Uh, I had never heard the piano played like that before. And I didn't know it could be played like that. What I did know immediately was it wasn't likely going to be me who was going to be the next guy to play it that way based on how well he could do that. Um, so those are my five: Beatles, Hendrix, McLaughlin, Coltrane, and Oscar Peterson. Yeah, superb picks, Rich. Yeah, love them, love them all, and our listeners love them too because it, it turns us on to new things and or things that we we like to revisit. So no, great stuff. Um, our last uh, our last question, sadly, Rich, um, for this time around at least, is the quick fire ten, where we fire ten questions at you that you try and answer as sh- in the most short and sharp way possible. So, Paul, yeah. over to you. First question, Rich, stereo or mono? Stereo. Sitting or standing? Well, doing what? Playing, sorry. Play. <laughs> now, that's actually <laughs> really, that's a legitimate point. <laughs> we'll have to adjust it. See, that's, you're too quick. Yeah, so while playing keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though it's a challenge, standing. And that's why, and, and I do it in chic. It, it's a challenge though. It's not easy. There's a whole choreography to it. It's confusing. It's a whole separate en- en- entity a- aspect to me executing that show beyond what I'm doing with my hands. I actually have, it's a dance, but yeah, standing. <laughs> 
We, I will never think of that question the same way again. We're going to have to rephrase that, I think. Um, a key tars, sexy or an abomination? There's a picture of me at the age 17 playing a Univox piano hung around my neck, five sets at weddings and bar mitzvahs, holding that bad boy up. I was in good shape in those days. Um, I think it's sexy when it's played well, but people getting out there and doing a half-hearted job of attempting to execute guitar licks, not so much. Um, furthermore, it's sexier on people half my age than it is or, on me or her. Or, or Niall Rogers. Niall Rogers, the guitar looks good, but yeah. I've never seen Niall Rogers. No, I, I, can't, I can't imagine him actually playing one, but if you did drape one over him, it'd still look good. Yeah. I mean, going back to the Coltrane thing, he does a hilarious imitation of McCoy Tyner at the piano. Niall does. He's, when he said he can actually. Bong, 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 me, 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 bong, 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 me, 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 He can like actually do that. But anyway, uh, fire away. <laughs> uh, and I think knowing your skills, I know the answer to this one, but transpose button or adjust on the fly? Uh, it's going to surprise you. There is a part of the show that I play transposed. Why, you ask? Because I originally learned it in the original key, and we play it a whole step down. And as much as I can and have played it a whole step down, I like the way it lays in my hands in the original key, and I don't have perfect pitch, so it doesn't mess me up. Whereas uh, my son and other people I know, Russell Graham, have per perfect pitch and pl playing transposed instruments is a little confusing to them because what you're seeing doesn't represent what you know. Like, But for me, my pitch is mostly relative. So generally speaking, as a gauntlet to be thrown down, yes, we should play it all in the actual key that it's in. But uh, there is a moment in the show where uh, there's one bit of music that I play transposed because I just like the way it lays on my hands better. And I'll leave it to everybody to guess what that is. <laughs> cool, cool, very cool. Um, all right, the next one, keyboard stands, uh, the X stand style or anything else but the X stand style? Anything else, not anything else, but, but definitely the X stand is one of the worst ideas in modern technological history. And I would like to personally have a meeting with the guy who decided this was a good idea. Um, Z stands for me. Why? I need clarity under the keyboard for my feet, especially if I'm, well, not even especially if I'm standing up, sitting down too. Uh, have X, X stands are the bane of my existence and I hate them. There you go. How's clear. That? That's clear. Um, oh, that's a quote. It, 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 this may, it may have been a while, Rich, but last gig you attended as an audience member. <laughs> and don't worry and that pause is not uncommon we, we've been tempted to drop this question because most working musicians don't really tend to go to gigs it was before pandemic i believe it was a strange folk show in connecticut which i attended with my late friend and artist farhad humayan and um, possibly my son, James. Um, I think that was the last live gig I saw. Strange Folk is a band that I worked with in the late 1990s and, and co-produced a record with. And they're very, very dear friends of mine. They're, a, they're called a jam band. And they're from Vermont uh, is where they met, although they don't live in Vermont anymore. And uh, they occasionally do reunion gigs. And this was one of those. And I was bringing an artist I was working with at the time to see some very dear friends of mine. The artist is from Pakistan. So this is also a cultural thing to bring him to shows in America so that he can enjoy that part of what our culture is like, whatever that's worth. And uh, so that's the last one I recall at the moment. And the one before that was Bela Fleck and Chris Teeley playing a duet show on banjo and mandolin, which was the plinkiest thing I've ever heard, but it was wonderful. Thank you, I love it. Um, the, the best thing about playing live music? Sharing happiness with the audience. Great. By far. By far. Absolutely by far. That's... I'll, I'll, I could well up and get emotional if I really get into it. But um, 
that is where the privilege aspect lies. Everything else is just what you go through to get there. But that's the privilege aspect. Now, learning to play your instrument <laughs> couldn't hurt either. But, um, but for me, the most joyous aspect of doing this for people is sharing their happiness and getting to participate in their happiness. I have a little sort of joke, offhand joke, I say, where we sneak into people's hearts and throw a party and then everybody goes home happy. And that's kind of how I view it, is we sneak into their hearts and everybody goes home happy. And that's what, that's what we're there to do. That's what they came for. It actually may exceed what they think they came for, but uh, it's, a, it's the privilege right there in a nutshell. That's a philosophy for life. Great answer. And worst thing about live gigs, Rich? I'm struggling to come up with the worst. I mean, if the, if the music isn't good, if you're struggling to play with the people you're gigging with, if it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm in this bubble of playing in the same band for 30 years or whatever. And, um, and with one of the world's greatest musicians happened to play guitar and wrote all these great songs. So there aren't too many downsides, you know, if they are, they're logistical and lifestyle related and what you have to go through and the preparation aspects and you've got to, stay at least up to a certain condition to be able to just cope with life on the road. And like, you know, at our age stuff happens and, you know, you may have a bum knee one day or you may get, you know, <laughs> not that I played 15 minutes of ping pong backstage in Scotland and I was sore for like the next day and a half, you know, so I'm not in quite as good a shape as I used to be. And you think you were, and you go ahead and do something. And then the next day your back aches or something, or, you know, like stupid stuff like that. And the logistics of getting from place to place, particularly right now, because of the unique challenges faced by a absolutely overburdened airline industry that is almost devoid of employees and even Worse, the employees that they've got are, for the most part, highly inexperienced. So uh, log jams at airports and things that get in the way, that, that, that come between you and that moment where you get to share happiness with people. Everything else seems like a burden, but, but not too much. And you're always willing to go through it because of the good parts, you know. So if there's a downside, it's the going, you know, it's the rigors of getting to places and that. Being in places is wonderful but getting to places is not always wonderful. Yeah, and as you said, it's exacerbated by the, the current situation we, we find ourselves in around the world. So um, second last question, Rich, name one thing that you would like to see invented that would make your life as a keyboard player easier. I, I don't see it. That's like a gear question. And uh, I, I, the only one I'd suggest to you, Rich, is you need that same role and action in the brand new line of keyboards. They've got one. Oh, you do. There you go. There you go. And, and, and I, I hope to be playing it before long, but I don't. Um, but I could, but as I said, it's not broken. I can continue no, to do that's it. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't need things to be made easier. Is that an acceptable answer to that yeah. question? Of course it is. Of we have is. such a, such a, uh, uh, whatever garden of fantastic options in gear, in software, in ways of doing things and ways of executing art and creativity musically that didn't exist before. All I want is two or three other people who like to play Roly Seaboard who want to do chamber music with me. Cause I really desperately want to try to play chamber music on Roly Seaboards with other Seaboard players. I am completely obsessed. It's funny. We've gotten this far in this interview. We're an hour and 10 minutes in, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but I am totally obsessed with the Rolly Seaboard. I've been practicing it for six, seven years now, and I'm still occasionally sounding like a beginning violin student, but I love it. I tell you, that it, sounds and, like a hell of a project to chamber. Like That sounds like a great idea, Rich. You, you need I'd to love to play chamber yeah. music on Rolly Seaboards. And I'm not trying to do Tomita with the music either, uh, nor am I trying to be strictly imitative. But in other words, it's not about flashing synthesizer sounds at people in a classical repertoire context. It's about using the expressive capabilities of these instruments to try to create cool timbres that do support the music, but don't necessarily have to call attention to themselves, but uh, feature the 
the skills of the players and thus providing a demanding environment for us all to get better at it. Because the first thing I did when I got my Seaboard was try to play a Bach violin concerto, which is insanely difficult to do and make sound good. But I just decided to start from something really difficult. And, uh, you know, it's getting better all the time. And I love the thing. And I, I it, at home, I'm obsessed with it. And guitar, by the way, I play a lot of guitar at home. Um, so there's nothing that anybody needs to invent. I just want to get better at the things I'm working on. I never expected to see something like that. that no, it is amazing. Um, and speaking of amazing pieces of gear, but there's no right or wrong answer with this last one, Rich. Red keyboards, yes or no? You said rent? Red, uh, red, R-E-D, sorry. Yeah, red. Oh. If it says Nord on it, it's fine with me. So I assume, I mean, there aren't too many different red keyboards. No, that's was, right. Yeah. For a moment, we're talking about the, the Nord company. And yeah. I think they make outstanding instruments that do a lot of things really, really well. And as long as you don't try to apply one of their instruments to something that it's not designed to do well, you're going to have a good gig. And I, I got to play on one of their stage. I got to play a gig with a friend of mine on one of the Nord stage, some version of it. I don't know. And it was entirely enjoyable for me to play. I quite liked the availability of the effects in real time in front of you right there on the, on the buttons and stuff you can get to it. I like the pseudo draw. I'm fine with pseudo draw bars. I'm not a real organ player anyway. So un traditional ways of accessing those kinds of sounds is not really that big a problem for me because I wasn't brought up driving a Hammond like a Ferrari. Um, their synths are fantastic. Their keyboard actions are great. I like the piano product. Um, so I got, I, I you know, I, the aesthetic is okay, but, but uh, they make great products. So who cares? That's right. No, great answer. And Rich, thank you so much. Cannot thank you. You've spent well over an hour with us. Um, and, you know, knowing how England works, you're due for another meal. It's time It's time for the... If you, <laughs> you didn't, you didn't no, know. It's going to be a while. That's, that's right. <laughs> so, no, look, thank you. I mean, it's, it's obvious you're a huge player of substance. We knew that before we met with you, but it's been further reinforced by speaking with you and, and can't thank you enough. And I know you, uh, you and Sheik are in Australia relatively recently, but hopefully we see you down here again in the future as well um and, and so yeah we're, we're you know really appreciate your time i really appreciate your kindness and your invitation and i really enjoyed the conversation oh paul that was a hell of an experience i i, I feel like i've just been on a roller coaster ride but without the motion sickness yeah it was it was great yeah, rich really does think really deeply about, about music and is clearly very passionate about it and I'm, I'm sure everyone who's watching this on YouTube will agree. His passion just just shone through, you know, and just he left us with so many gems. It was it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, no, absolutely superb. So again, huge thanks to Rich for his time, and um, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did re recording it. And um, yeah, we're, I'd love to catch up with Rich again. I said I, I feel like we've only scratched the surface. So hey, you know we, what? Yeah, you know what, David? Before you before you wrap up, you know what? The, the most positive thing I got out of that, I should, I'm, I'm being cheeky. It wasn't actually the most positive thing I got out of it, but uh, probably unbeknownst to anyone who watches or listens to this podcast, uh, I have an acoustic guitar sitting in the corner of my office and I, I don't play it very often. I've had it for a long time and I've never changed the strings on it. And <laughs> I've always felt bad about that, but, but I don't know. Now I feel kind of good about that. Go. I can, Maybe it's a, it can be an artistic choice. What do you reckon? You're the Rick Kasich of, of Adelaide. <laughs> I like it. I can tell you I'm not anything like that, but it, anyway. <laughs> no, that's gold. No, thank you. Fine. It's a good anecdote. Um, so a quick shout out to our, our gold and silver supporters, the Core Chrome User Group. And Greg, thank you, Greg, as always. Um, the Core Chrome User Group is on Facebook, of course. Uh, Brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys, still going strong on tour at the moment. Uh, Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew. We love Tammy and Tammy runs a great, uh, she's such a, an aficionado of, of some great music and, and is a huge supporter and we appreciate it. And of course, the musicplayer.com forums and Elk Electronic. We, we really appreciate it. And yes, Paul is indeed wearing the Keyboard Corners t-shirt there. So, um, you know, we really appreciate their support as well. 
So we'll be back again in a fortnight or so, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means. So our website, as always, is keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at Keyboard Chronicles or The Keyboard Chronicles. You'll definitely find us. And on Twitter at The Keyboard CHR1. Um, if you like good old-fashioned email, then drop us a line at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. We are actually also on, just as an aside, on Instagram and LinkedIn. We're everywhere now, just about. We're not on TikTok, though, Paul. I'm not sure I can come to that party, but uh, we are on Instagram under the Keyboard Chronicles and on LinkedIn for those business types um, at the Keyboard Chronicles. So um, finally, if you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength and keep this little ship afloat. So that's www.patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. Someone's got to pay for Paul's hotel rooms. So he, he refuses to record anywhere else but a hotel room and it costs us a fortune. So we need every bit of help we can get. Um, so Paul, thanks again for joining me. Uh, again, thanks for inviting me to come along and co-host with you. And that's the mini bar behind me there, David. We'd, and I'm just going to go and rate it now. No, I think Paul, Paul's actually misrepresenting because one of the other parts of his writer is he has to record in a motel room with a modular synth in case in the background. This is what Ooh. sort of diva he is. <laughs> so most importantly, thanks to all of you out there for listening and we'll see you back here next episode. Yeah.